The Rings of Power is at last available to watch. The acting is excellent, the series is breathtakingly gorgeous, the set, costume and visual effects work is flawless, and it all has the air of an epic story. These first two episodes have just one flaw. They spend a lot of time setting everything up. Since this series is set in the second age of Tolkien's imagined mythology, they must both introduce the characters and people we will be following in the show and explain the most significant historical occurrences from the first age. As a result, world building is the focus of every episode, especially episode 1 and to a lesser extent episode 2. Over the course of the two chapters, we encounter five distinct civilizations from four distinct peoples. Alderonian Elves, Sylvan Elves, Men of the Southlands, Halffoots and Dwarves. Each is distinguished by their height, years, costume and accent, which is referred to as posh English accent or received pronunciation for Elves. Scottish accent for dwarfs, South Irish accent for all halffoots, and perplexingly, North English accent for men of the Southlands, presumably influenced by the Starks of Winterfell, as John Rhys Davis did in Lord of the Rings. Galadriel, Gil Galen, and Elrond are the Andorian elves who most closely resemble our expectations. Since elves don't age, these are literally the same people we meet in the Lord of the Rings hundred of years later. As a result, it only makes sense that their attire, accents, cultures and other characteristics more or less correspond to what we know from the later tales. More intriguingly are the Sylvan Elves. Arondir and his allies are a colonisation force that have taken over the Southlands. They express opinions that are frequently shared by colonising powers, such as the notion that they are subjugated this people for their own benefit and that they are naturally superior to men they control. In general, these elves give off a more earthly, ancient Roman atmosphere than we used to see in from these typically ethereal beings, because Arundir is specifically referred to as a soldier, has a uniform a commanding officer and talks about being stationed there. Given that Arundir is in love with a human woman, it is a welcome shift and creates some pretty intriguing tale possibilities. However, in this episode we get to see the great kingdom of Khazagdum, later known as Moria, at its height. The dwarves we first encounter in episode 2 are much more similar to the dwarves we know from the later stories. It's interesting to see what we've only ever known as desolate halls at the peak of their power, and we learn about some new dwarf ceremonies. Another wonderful touch is the explanation of why Durin is so angry with Elrond. Elrond didn't consider how long 20 years is for a dwarf, therefore he misses Durin's wedding and birth of his son, since he actively chose to live as an elf, and that's what irritates him. It's unexpected, somewhat moving, and serves as a reminder of the diversity among these various groups of people and civilizations. Of course, the Harfoots are the least well-known group, since despite our familiarity with their later offspring, the Hobbits, Harfoots have never introduced to us before. These people have a very interesting design that references the Hobbits and Harfoots that Tolkien talked about as having a more fairy-like characteristics. They walk barefoot and are quiet. They can disappear quickly. Humans rarely see them. They have an air of ancient British tradition and incorporate elements of elves, fairies and spirits that Tolkien's high elves do not. The Harfoots we encounter in the Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power differ significantly from Tolkien's hobbits and they varied kin in a number of important ways. They are roving nomads, not lovers of luxury and comfort. We observe them vanishing into crevices in rocks and trees that are far from tidy, warm and cosy like Bag End. They are therefore created to resemble fairies in the series. They may swiftly blend in because of their rugged attire and plant and tree fragments in their hair. 
their costumes are just about as natural and realistic enough to feel genuine. It's wonderful to see more female dwarfs and harfoots in this series, as females of these species were largely absent from the original literature and movies. The relationship between Prince Durin and his wife Deesa adds some much needed humour to the narrative. It also serves further to differentiate their story from that of the later hobbits we are so familiar with, by following two young female Harfoots rather than four young male ones. While we still get to know this world through the dwarfs, episode 2 has a more action than episode 1. With the sea snake and orc attack sequences kicking off the adventure phase of the story, while this scene was created for the series, the sea serpent attack is a great example of the kind of thing that feels like it could only happen in one of Tolkien's stories. Nothing about it conflicts with anything, and in that context it makes sense. But with Gladriel's leap from the ship to Valnor and the comet with the engomatic guy inside, episode 1's climax is greater. The path to Valnor was not closed off to non-elven mariners in Tolkien's history until the Numenor invasion during the Second Age, and this visualisation of it is intriguing. It undoubtedly creates the idea of entering another realm rather than merely travelling through space, which makes sense for a trip to the Undying Lands. Gladriel's decision to let a single tear fall down her cheek during the rite, in which veiled ladies strip the soldiers of their armour, is a powerful and emotional moment. The conclusion of episode 2 is absolutely adequate and underlines the impending peril, although it lacks some of the emotional power and build-up of episode 1's climax. But now, back to the comet's enigmatic visitor. Who is he? The most plausible option is Sauron, but Tolkien's legend and Gladriel's belief that he wasn't out there when the comet hit Middle-earth seems to cast doubt on that notion. According to Tolkien's history, the wizards, or Meyer, won't reach Middle-earth for a thousand years. Who's to say though that they won't introduce one of the wizards early when the series had already condensed in centuries of that history into a span of one human lifespan, for this adaptation? If so, Alata and Palandor, the two blue wizards, appear to be the most plausible candidates. The peoples of Middle-earth, Christopher Tolkien's book, on his father's early and incomplete drafts and writing process places their arrival on Middle-earth during the Second Age, which would put them in the ideal setting for the series, despite the fact that the timeline in Lord of the Rings places their arrival there with the other three, Gandalf, Saruman and Radagast in the Third Age. The only problem is that they allegedly already arrived simultaneously. I can't help but cherish the uneasy idea that perhaps this is Gandalf, despite the fact that if it is, it will tremendously enrage people who prefer more faithfulness to the original source material. Did you also notice that he covers himself with a blanket that somewhat is grey? These are excellent episodes for a new series premiere. The speed of the information and exposition is appropriate for the audience and we'll be getting a little more of it as we meet the Numenarians in episode 3. In addition to being incredibly lovely to look at, there's a lot to love about this show, and because the place clearly ramps up in episode 2, we can be sure that we'll do so for the remaining several episodes as well. Overall, I'm intrigued and want to watch the upcoming episode, which is exactly what the first few episodes of a new show ought to accomplish. I rate the first episode 4 star and four and a half for the second. I'm generally excited for future episodes. They've exceeded what I expected. Like and subscribe. Until the next time, on Middle Earth Invader.